uh, Vice President of Education for the World Affairs Council, and I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's event, especially those of you who are new to the Council's Millennial Membership. As always, we ask that you take a moment to silence your cell phones. However, if you want to keep them out and tweet about the program, or like us on Facebook, please feel free to do so. Um, as many of you may know, the Council's new Millennial Membership and Program Series has been named um, for one of our city's most entrepreneurial and enlightened <coughs> civic leaders, A.J. Raju, who's not here in a moment, but I'm sure we'll be back in a little shortly. Um, it is through A.J.'s sponsorship and generous support that we, A.J.'s here, stand up please. Thank you. The has made this new membership and program series possible. Um, and I think, as some of you know, this series is geared towards graduate students and professionals between the ages of 23 and 40. So we're certainly not excluding other council members and other council staff or checking versus Door. Our intention <laughs> is to feature topics, speakers, and venues that are specifically designed with young working professionals in mind and to offer some of the best and brightest intellectuals and innovators making headlines today. And we are honored to start with Hasina Shurjan, the founder and CEO of Aid Afghanistan for Education. Ms. Shurjan moved to the state in 1978 from Afghanistan and returned in 1990s upon learning about what was happening to girls and women under the Taliban regime. Forced to wear burqas, severely restricted, uh, moving around freely in their own villages and communities, and most notably forbidden to attend school. Um, Hasina traveled to Afghanistan and over the course of weeks and months in a narrative I'm sure she's soon going to share with us, she ended up helping to develop five schools, five clandestine schools that survived numerous attacks upon both the students and teachers and five schools that ultimately survived the Taliban regime. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Shurjan.
is a PowerPoint. Um, do we do we have a PowerPoint? No. Um, it's supposed to be coming from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might be coming. He had sent it, so maybe it's on its way. Um, so I just wanted to show you some pictures of um, what Afghanistan really looks like, because what I'm gathering is that all people. Uh, when, when people hear here about Afghanistan, it's, um, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Magic, you know? I, was, I forgot the, the USB, and, and as I was trying to get into my, uh, my Gmail account, I, of course, forgot my password. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the person that I sent this to yesterday was calling me at the same time on the phone. And I asked them to send it to us, so um, there it is. Um, can we just, yeah, okay, great. Um, there. This is one of our schools uh, in, in northeastern part of Afghanistan, in, in Badakhshan province, where we have a border with China, where a small border with China we have. That's the, the school building you see our students are speaking from it. Um, the, the, it's a beautiful area, but on one side of it is very dry, and the other side has a lot of water, unfortunately. Um, and can we just go to the next slide? This is a picture I took driving down from that school. This is like halfway down the mountain already, and I'm terrified of heights, so I, um, but I had to take this picture. So um, it, it's an incredibly beautiful place. So, I just wanted to show you some pictures that I, I have taken traveling around the country because just going to the east part of um, Afghanistan. This is also Badakhshan. The, the three rivers come together in this spot in, in by July. The water goes all the way up to the bottom of that white, first white building. We have some incredible rivers and, and <coughs> books. This is when I was born there with, with Juan in Herat province. The, this, uh, this fortress has already been um, restored. And inside of it right now, there's an art gallery and many conferences are taking place. The Afghanistan for Education came about after I went uh, for the first time, after 19 years of living in the US, I went to Pakistan. Um, and that's, that trip, in fact, changed my life because it was the first time that I went into the re refugee camps and realized that education was not really accessible for everyone. And just because we, were privileged to have what we had that the majority of the Afghan people didn't have any of it. So um, that trip to, to refugee camps and witnessing that 50-year-old women were just learning how to read and write, and their eyes were glowing as if they just found a treasure, and it's almost the end of their lives. So when I came back to the US, a lot of, uh, many of the Afghan uh, professionals called because I brought a lot of pictures and slides with me. So we met and decided that education is the most important thing and, and it's really the lack of education is what has gotten us where we are right now in Afghanistan. Um, we, in the 70s, we had 11% literacy rate in Afghanistan and today we have, a, we, we still have 80% illiteracy rate in Afghanistan. So how, how is it even possible to have a democracy for elections? Um, so, I couldn't do very much in, in 1995 when I first went into uh, to Pakistan because I couldn't go into Afghanistan because of the faction of war was still going on. Um, however, we started helping some of the <coughs> small schools in the refugee camps and outside of refugee camps. So in 1999, when I was in Peshawar, I decided that I'm going to go into Afghanistan and meet with the Taliban and see what's going on. And 
they were saying that because of money, <coughs> the, the, they have to close down girls' schools. So I thought money shouldn't be an issue. If, if they open up the girls' schools, we should have money quoted from the whole world. Well, um, that's not exactly what happened. I, I did go into Afghanistan and met with many of the Taliban leaders. Unfortunately, they were not, of course, willing to open up the girls' schools, but they were keeping their own wives and daughters in Pakistan because they couldn't imagine not having their daughters being educated. Mm -hmm. When I heard that from many of their leaders, wow. I realized that these people were not in charge. In fact, the, the deputy minister of uh, education said that order comes from up above and we implement it. Whoever the up above was, it was somebody outside of Afghanistan. So I had one week left and I had $3,000 with me. And I didn't want to take that back. So uh, I met with many of the teachers who were already out on the streets begging and uh, decided to help five of them who were widows and they had seven to nine kids. Um, so we very quickly set up uh, classrooms within their homes uh, for 250 students and I uh, we purchased uh, stationery and books and everything they needed and that's some money that somebody to pay the salaries of the teachers which was very little and I continued to send money to Pakistan um, so that this person was taking it into Afghanistan well of course the Taliban found out and they came in and, and beat up the kids and beat up the two mm -hmm. teachers and it was but they never really stopped coming to school when I came back in 2001, they were showing me their hands and saying, you know, the Taliban came and they beat us up and we were going hiding in the big chip, uh, like, you know, chicken coop size and all sorts of stories and they came and fought three times. So, uh, but when I asked them, why didn't you stop coming? They said, they, this is where we could learn and this is where our friends were and uh, I was not going, we were not going to give that up. So they found ways to come one by one and drop in the their books with the cover of the Quran, just to pretend they're going to a religious school. Um, and since then, after two months of meeting with many of the teachers and schools and um, students, I realized that the 17 and 18 year olds were sitting at second and third grade because of the seven years of, uh, that we had to stay home. So it took a very long time months in fact, to convince the government or to convince uh, the donors that there is a special need. And we really, it's not fair for these girls to sit for another 10 years um, to graduate. Eventually, it was not easy, eventually the ambassador, uh, the Danish ambassador that I met at a, at a reception, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to convince somebody that there's a need and nobody's paying attention. So. He said, oh, I will do it, so let's talk. So I went to his office and I explained what's going on. Um, he gave me $127,000 check. So with that, for the first year, we renovated three buildings. In 2003, most of Kabul was destroyed. We renovated three buildings, we hired teachers, we arranged three schools for 1,100 students, and at the end of the year, I had $20,000 left. So you don't really need billions of dollars to, to really rebuild a country or, or the education system. Um, since then, the organization grew, and now we are in nine provinces. Can we change slides, maybe? Can we just go through the slides? And we're, we're mainly working with marginalized Afghans, uh, meaning that those who didn't have access to education during the years of war <coughs> or don't have access to education right now. Because if you are 10 years old, there's nothing for you. And you've never had access to education, and we have millions of Afghans who are 10 and, or above, and they still have not had access to education. So there's really nothing for them to do. They can either sell potatoes on the streets or become a burned insurgent. They have to survive somehow. And at the same time, if girls get married young when they're 15, and this also happens every day, <coughs> they're not allowed legally to finish their high school. 
There was a place before the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Women Affairs happened, called the Association for Women. So young girls who got married and still needed to finish their high school would go to this association and to complete their high school and also learn a vocation, and then they had an option to go to a university or work. <coughs> Unfortunately, that place became a ministry. Since it became a ministry, they closed down all the programs. And I'm not really sure it's not clear what this ministry is doing. So we are the only one doing what that, that association used to do for young women. And nobody else is paying attention. So in <coughs> Afghanistan for education not only, can we just keep going through the slide? Um, so we're basically educating. And 99, you already know about that. We started in 2003, so we do have 3,000 female students. <coughs> we have 104 boys now, finally. The intention was not to only have this for girls, because boys suffered just as much during the Taliban period, and they still we really needed to focus on boys, because at the end of the day, it's the boys who are the terrorists. The 15-year-old boys who have nothing to do, they, they join the Taliban, and they're being brainwashed, and they need to be and so on. So we need to really pay attention to both genders. Gender kind of lost its meaning, really. And whether it's in America or in Afghanistan, we have a gender meaning. You know, we have a gender program. It's always it means women. So we really need to focus on both, and and uh, focusing. And if we really want the life of women to be better, we need to make the life of the men better just as well. Um, so we're working in nine provinces. Since 2009, we have given 1,000, since 2007, we've given 1,009 students graduated from our programs. Um, and most of them are working or going to universities. Some of them got scholarships. Uh, and um, some are mothers and they chose to stay home. But it really, the impact of educating the mothers is huge because majority of, 80% uh, of one of our schools in the north, and it's one province, 80% of the students said that my husband encourages me to go to school. And one of them said that we, I have uh, a son who goes to school um, in first grade, and he came home one night and asked me to do homework, and I couldn't do homework, and he cried all night. And I got up in the morning and told my husband that whether you like it or not, I found a school that I'm going there. And now my life has changed, and I, I study with my kids, and my kids study with me, and and it's you know husbands have more respect for the wives and the children. They they have more respect for the parents. They don't know that the husbands or the fathers are not graduates. So what happens is that my interpretation of the support from the husbands was that because they're not graduate, but it's much more difficult for men who are 27 year olds to back to school or sit at home for five or 10 grade. But it's a lot easier for them to say to their kids that it's better if you go study with your mother rather than saying that I'm not literate. So it's really crucial to, to educate mothers, <coughs> which will educate you know, the, the future generation. Um, and um, many of our students enter uh, Kabul University, despite the fact that there are thousands and thousands of students, something like 60 or 70,000 students take the entrance exam for the university, we still have, <coughs> our education system is very old. And the reform of the education system has not happened yet, unfortunately. We're still in the rote system and everybody's memorizing everything and no learning taking place, even though, you know, we may have 9 million kids coming to school, but it's not about numbers, you know, it's about what are they doing there. Um, so, can we, and these are just some pictures of our students in different provinces. We can go through, the rest are all pictures, so we can go through all the pictures. These boys are in fourth grade, you can see that they're much older. Um, 
it's a village that this is the first group or who are being educated. The first, the nearest school is five kilometers away. get them a certificate when they graduate and then they receive their high school diploma from the Ministry of Education. They don't have <coughs> education with the only NGO with an agreement with the government so that when our students graduate, the government will provide them with their high school diploma. Um, and they study 12 years within eight years with us. We don't have four months of holiday. I don't see that as necessary anymore. We used to have three months. I'm not sure why it's even four months now. Um, you know, they forget everything they learn. And when there's no point in giving them four months of holiday every winter time. We warm up the schools. I mean, we've lost so many years of progress that I think we should make. be working, you know, 24 seven and nobody should sleep. <laughs> <laughs> to catch up with the rest of the world. Or even just to catch up with our neighbors. fascinating to see what happens. This is our website, please visit. We, and, and then, um, there's one more slide, I think. That's my, my contacts, uh, please contact me if you like. My Gmail works, my uh, Yahoo was stuck two days ago, so <laughs> my Afghanistan address goes to Yahoo, and it's a big problem right now. Um, and I think if we don't pay attention to education in Afghanistan, we're not going to have peace anywhere. And, and all the investments that we have made in the past 12 years will be wasted. And how to uh, support the investments that have been made, and in Afghanistan for Education has been supported by USAID since 2007. And in March, Congress cut funding and USAID cut programs that was not really part of their larger program. This was a program that was designed based on a need um, and it was not part of the donors program, so it doesn't fit anywhere. Um, so they cut programs, and but I, I think to, to just cut programs that we have invested for so many years, like that without knowing that there's going to be, we did draft a, a strategic plan. At the end, they said that no, we don't have money. Um, it's, you know, that, that very little hope that has been uh, created in the last 12 years will be diminished if we close the schools and send 3,000 students home. So, um, please head to education in Afghanistan and we will put all the students together and, and we will have a conference to sit together. I think it will be much more interesting for the students to get up and speak about why we want to do this and why is this so important that unless we, we educate uh, people in the world, we're not going to have peace. So uh, definitely, if you could please have, you know, a couple of them who want to take the lead, uh, to send me an email, I can put them in touch with others, and then we can also be online. I, I will be accessible on Skype anywhere in the world. I will be still, uh, still in the U.S. for the next month. I, I will go home January 3rd, so um, we can we can talk and see what they can do. Yes, sir. Is the Afghan government supporting your work? The Afghan government, uh, we have an agreement for them to uh, give to our students uh, high school diploma when they graduate. So that's very important. However, uh, they are not willing to work and change policies so that the program will be under the government program. Eventually, they will have to, they have no choice because it's, it's growing. And as soon as we have enough funding to pay the salaries of the teachers right now and and cover the cost of what we have now for the next two years, we will expand to as many provinces as we can. 
So it keeps growing and it, it will eventually be part of, it has to be part of the government uh, program. Uh, but obviously, you know, this government, maybe they're thinking that they have just a few more months left, uh, don't have the time, maybe they don't know how, uh, but we really have to work on reform of the education system in Brazil. Yes, sir. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the curriculum in the latter years uh, that students take? We have to use the government curriculum in order for the students to receive their high school diploma from the government and also to take the university entrance exam. <coughs> so it's the government curriculum. They learn after seventh grade. They have all the main subjects, you know, whether there's physics, biology, chemistry, history, geography, and everything else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, I was just in India Could last year. Could you just speak a little louder? Oh, I'm yeah, sorry sure. about the people behind you. Um, uh, I was in India last year. I'm working on a project looking at uh, human rights development. And one of the things I was very interested in is how development agencies use the Convention on the Rights of the Child and other human rights instruments and the whole notion of a rights-based approach to development to advocate for, for things like, like education, for example. And so I just wondered, obviously, Afghanistan's a very different situation <coughs> in India, but I wondered what sort of use and what sort of traction these concepts of human rights, girls' rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, how useful are these ideas in advocating for girls' education and education in general? Are these concepts that you use a lot? Are they things that you don't find particularly <coughs> helpful when you're advocating with your partners? I wonder what role they play. There are a lot of people working on human rights and advocacy in Afghanistan and there are various different organizations. Um, it, it has been, of course, it's always useful to make sure that uh, people don't take advantage or, or especially, you know, with, the, with governments that's not really functional, um, that you, you have to support the voice of, of uh, those who don't have a voice. Uh, and again, but unless we educate the whole population, they still wouldn't know how to fight for their own rights. Mm -hmm. And you can't just always go and fight for somebody else's rights. They have to be able to stand up for themselves and, and fight for their own rights. So I think it is always good to look at, you know, what to do first. Unfortunately, you know, we've had a, a very much of a top-down approach to many development concepts and ideas, but uh, unless we educate the whole population as much as we can, um, these concepts will be temporarily because if the donors leave and those organizations don't have any more money to do what they're doing right now, nobody will pay any attention and people can't read and write for themselves or, or defend themselves. changes have you seen in the villages that have schools compared to those that don't have schools? <coughs> well, I, I can also uh, only talk about our own programs where, where they are, for example, you know, we had uh, 44 oh, no. students graduated from that village way up on top of the mountain, and um, they're <coughs> one, of, one of our students is in their 30s now. I asked her, what do you want to do now? And she said, now that I have my high school degree, I can, uh, we don't have a representative in the parliament, and I think I should be that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I know that she's going to do it. <laughs> so it's really, uh, it's amazing what, what really happens once you provide them with education, you don't have to worry about anything else. <coughs> Namaste, I'm from India. Uh, uh, we are very fond of Afghanistan and uh, we consider you as uh, very close friends. Uh, my question is that, you know, education isolation, uh, just going to school and coming back, you know, has just as much reach, but if you combine it with things like uh, culture and art, uh, movies, sports like cricket, football, and all of that, 
that gives you know a child much more bigger learning and and a scope. So around the school, what are you doing to sort of promote a whole like a 360 degree uh, education <coughs> or an experience rather than uh, rather than going from point to point? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it's it's unfortunate that we have to use the government curriculum that doesn't really leave a lot of room to do anything else. However, we have libraries for our students. They love to read. They love to uh, put together magazines as their thing. You know, they, they put together magazines and then we share magazines with them schools. Uh, poetry fights, we call them po poetry fights, mm -hmm. uh, has always been a very big thing in Afghanistan. We used to, the, we were forced to memorize a lot of poetry. And, and if you really sit down with Afghans and have a conversation for two hours, an hour of that is always poetry because there is a poem about everything. <laughs> so they, uh, they, and, and, and I remember my father, we, we conversing through Rumi all night with his friends every, uh, every full moon, every full moon and every month, uh, all night until like three or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, they, they were not really, they were basically, you know, because the Rumi had a poem about everything, so they, did, they never talked. They were, you know, one of them would recite something in the other one. And, and it was a big puzzle for me, of course, at that time. And I had no idea what these people were doing. Um, so um, they, they do that. They, they do memorize a lot of poetry still. And they go to uh, participate in these uh, contests on, on uh, national TV. And they have won many times. Um, we also have uh, field trips for them, so they do go to museums and whatever. Whenever there is an art show in, in Kabul, uh, there there has been a lot of art shows. In fact, now paintings and photography and all sorts of uh, art shows, and we, we always make sure that they have a chance. So some of the classrooms, if we can, take thousands of students, of course, but some of uh, the uh, 10, 11, 12 grades. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, wish you all the best. Yes, sir. Here's a microphone for you, sir. Oh. Well, since you've uh, lived in Afghanistan for quite a while, and I think Afghanistan has been on my mind since 1978, and I think it's been on everybody's mind since Roger Kipling's Kim. So it's a very compelling story and very compelling pictures and I was wondering if you could maybe sketch for us two or three ways in which the country has changed if not transformed 2001. <laughs> But then, of course, uh, from what I saw in 1999 um, was very tragic for me, of course, because, you know, growing up in a beautiful city, Kabul is one of the most beautiful cities throughout history, and kings always wanted to come and spend their holidays in Kabul. And in fact, Kabul University was one of the best universities in the region. Um, it was a nice, clean city, very quiet, very few cars. Um, and, and then in 1999, what I saw was most all shops and everything was boarded up. Mm -hmm. The feeling was more like, um, what is the movie, The Day After? Yes. The, the house after the, the atomic bomb. Yeah. It was that kind of feeling as if people were sitting around as if their souls were taken out of their body. Mm -hmm. Every, there, was a, there was a tremendous amount of fear in people and nobody could, you couldn't talk, you couldn't laugh. Nothing was going to laugh. You couldn't listen to music and you grew up with music. And you know, when I grew up, you know, you could, you could hear music from every corner of the city. And that is back, of course. You know, you're walking down the street and there's music all over the place. Um, every uh, kebab stand has its music going on and there are these carts that are selling music and their, their radios are blasting <coughs> music on the streets. And Afghans love music and they love sports. 
and they've done really, really well in sports. I don't know if you know, uh, we have just won uh, uh, medals uh, for a, a, a regional, um, what is it, Asia, the soccer, um, the soccer match for the Central Asia. And it was incredible. The, the people were sitting on top of the cars, hanging out from, from the windows of the cars, uh, going through the city all night long until four o'clock in the morning. And dancing, and sometimes they would just get out of the cars and they would start dancing all the way down the streets. And then I took a picture of this uh, <coughs> man standing up on his motorbike, going down this hill, with the with the flag, there was just flags all over the place. It was incredible. It was just a, a sign of a need for nationalism, mm -hmm. and and the sports have done it for them. And we have just one. You know, Afghans are really it, they're extremely talented in certain things that they can do very well. And sports is one of them. Somebody came and opened up a, an NGO teaching Afghans how to do um, skateboarding. You wouldn't believe it. You know, I now I, I see Afghans and they're fearless. So in the traffic, I see like there, there is a, and they learn how to do skateboard, uh, rollerblades, and rollerblading through the city. It's incredible. So none of this really existed, of course, during the Taliban, but even before <coughs> that. Um, uh, so, you know, it's I have to say that there's been a, a, a really tremendous amount of change since 1999 when I first went back to Afghanistan. And there are a lot of, uh, of course, the roads are, uh, finally they are fixing Kabul streets also, hoping that by the time I get back it's all fixed. Um, but uh, uh, roads are fixed, you know, there are zillions of buildings popping up left and right. And People are working and um, younger generations are very hopeful and they're really working very hard uh, to educate themselves and that's very important. We have a lot of um, private universities now, private schools in Kabul. Media is in incredible. This is another thing that happened. We have hundreds of uh, newspapers and magazines and radio stations and TV stations. Uh, I just heard yesterday that Afghanistan media is now the second one in the region um, as, as far as having a free media. Um, so there's been a lot of changes, I have to say. You know, it's not, um, I, but we still have a lot of work to do. I mean, it's, it's unrealistic to think that we're rebuilding a country within 12 years that has gone through 40 years of war. Um, so it's, it, we still have a, a lot of work and a lot of foundation work, you know, like education. Because really, I mean, it, it's nice to have roads and buildings, but who's going to use it if we don't educate the people? Um, yes, do we have a student? Any students, any questions from the student? Yes. <coughs> um, this is perhaps more of a political question, but how could the Taliban uh, be so against education when there's such a strict Islamic um, force in that country and one of the, the big things is to be able to pick up the Quran and read it. That's just one thing that I don't, I don't understand. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. <coughs> That's a very good question, you know, and even when the Taliban were ruling Afghanistan, I was wondering why the Islamic, Islamic world was so excited.
and use with Afghanistan right now. In fact, they you have a whole week of holiday because of the, there was a suicide bombing a few days ago, and they have given everybody a really like, six days off, which makes me worry because I'm, I have a, also a small company producing home decor products, and they have orders <coughs> to fill, and they have now six days of holiday because they're worried about security. Um, bringing a jury together, which is also illegal in fact, when we have a parliament and if there's no need for you know, an additional um, council of mm -hmm. elders to come together to, um, to ratify whether, whether we should sign an agreement with the U.S. or not. Um, I think this agreement will be signed no matter what. There will have to be some compromises from both sides. Um, it's not it's not for um, it's not to our advantage or to U.S. advantage to not sign this agreement. So um, you know, Afghanistan was not born in 2001, and I don't think it's going to die in 2014. So if we go through some difficult times, we have to go through some difficult times. The thing is that we now have a democracy that we don't really own, unfortunately. Um, you can't have a democracy in a country where a majority of the people are not veterans. Um, so we <coughs> may have to go through some difficult times for a while, but everybody has to fight for their own democracy. If you look at the US, you know, American women fought for 72 <coughs> years to be able to vote. And now they own it, nobody can take that away from them. You know, if, if we look at Egypt and what's happening now, they're having a difficult time right now. They may go through some very difficult times for a very long time. But once they have their own democracy, nobody can take it away from them. We have a democracy in Afghanistan, you can take it away tomorrow, nobody will notice. <laughs> <laughs> it's really unfortunate that it all happened that way. Uh, so after <coughs> what their own problems are, how to sort it out. What do we really want? What kind of system do we want? So um, I don't really have an answer for what's going to happen in 2014. All I know is that Afghanistan will survive and will move forward and there will be always an Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Hi. I, um, I completely agree with your um, thought that we should equally educate both the men but I wonder what effect that has on your school in such a patriarchal society by your project partner. Is it having an impact on you know, female empowerment with these younger students? Or does it not matter as much? Of course it helps. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely, you know. And our students are older, you know. Our students are anywhere between 15 to 27 years old. Uh, we basically will help anybody who wants to have a high school degree. Um, so it, 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 of course, empowers the women, it empowers the whole family. And, and it's crucial, yeah, I mean, <coughs> we are keeping it a very low profile. We're not putting signs on the buildings. Uh, but students come in with uniforms, of course, everybody in the whole neighborhood know that there's a school there. We're trying to avoid problems, but you know, one of our schools in, in Wardak province, which is not very far from Kabul, it's about, um, an hour and a half uh, <coughs> south, but that school was attacked in 2006, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people from the village asked us not to reopen it, and it's not a very safe area. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we continue working wherever we can work. Mm -hmm. different 
the men and women to um, take that next step into the workforce after they get their diploma, or is, what is the next step after they get their diploma? Considering that only 10% go to university and 5% mm -hmm. obtain jobs, what does the rest of the future look like for them? For, um, well, <laughs> it's up to them, you know, I, I, we, it's, it's too, um, we are keeping track of some of our students, and we have a database of our students, and those who are at universities, we are following up with them and to see where they go and how far they go. Some women just decide that they're, they're just happy with their high school diploma, and they don't want to pursue anything further. We did a, um, uh, a training for our 12th graders once, a vocational training for teaching them how to do <coughs> basic office management and basic accounting and um, how to write letters to the government and things like that. 168 of them and they all got jobs. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, if we have enough resources and, and continue doing something for the 12th graders, well, this was done, of course, in Kabul, uh, where we placed them in different NGOs and banks and businesses for three months of internship, and they were hired in every place that we we placed them. And in fact, one of them is working as an accountant in our own office now. Um, and in the provinces, we've done a little bit of a research. Normally, the students request <coughs> uh, a training for, for something that they want to do that they think that will bring them uh, some money and they can either produce <coughs> something or Establish their own. For example, these students that graduated in Balakshan, I asked a few of them what they're doing, and one of them said, I'm, I'm going to open up my own tailoring shop, and I'm going to have my classmates help me. And now that we can read and write, we can, uh, we can do this together because I know how to tailor very well, and I can teach these. And I said, What do you need? He said, Bring me some catalogs. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm planning on taking some catalogs with me. For <coughs>
millennial program from dorm room to boardroom. It's a new world 